we got some good special music, but I'm going to let them sing after I get done. John chapter number 7 and verse number 37. <clears throat> John 7, 37, the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Father, bless this holy word now. May we receive it tonight, Father, not as the word of man, but as it is the word of God. In thy righteous name I pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated. This is one of the most profound declarations in the whole Bible. It's a powerful, powerful statement about something, and you have to see it in context tonight to understand what's going on here. Now, the great feast that he's talking about is the Feast of Tabernacles. The seventh month, the 15th day of the month, they would create booths. Then they'd gather in those booths, and there they would be reminded of where they'd come from, that they had once been strangers and pilgrims and slaves in a foreign land. But now they were protected and they had a shelter over them. And so therefore it related to their salvation. Remember the Gospel of John is written about salvation. These things are written that you might believe. God gave Israel feast days. And these feast days are very important. They started with the feast of, uh, of uh, what well, you might want to call it a feast, but it was the Passover. That's the beginning of months. Without the shedding of the blood of the lamb, there's no use for any of the rest of the feast. So it becomes the foundation for everything else. If you don't have that, that, uh, that blood atonement, then there's no need for any of the rest of it. But the seventh month, the tenth day of the month, is the great day of atonement, Yom Kippur. And the day of atonement was a solemn day, the most solemn day of all the year, because the priest would enter in, the high priest would go into the holy place, there he would stand before God for all the people. He had epaulets on his shoulder, 12 of them, six this side, six this side. He had a plate on his chest with 12 stones. Each one of these stones represented one of the tribes of Israel. So therefore he was standing in their stead. He was an intermediary. And if God accepted him and his prayer and his sacrifice, then he would bless him. And then when he blessed him, that high priest would walk back outside and the people were standing out there and they were waiting for that high priest. They were waiting on him. And when he came back outside, he would pronounce the blessing on them, on each one of them, on them as a group. He would bless them with the blessing that he had received. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ gives gifts unto men and the gifts that he gives unto men are the gifts that he's received from the Father. And he blesses us. But when he came out on that seventh month, that tenth day of the month, on the Day of Atonement, he appeared to them that were looking for His appearing. They waited for Him, for His appearing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, will appear the second time without sin, unto salvation for those that look for His appearing. You better be looking for Him. You better watch Him for His appearing. That's why it's called that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. So after the Day of Atonement had been finished, and brought to fruition, and the people had been blessed. Then the 15th day of the month, that seventh month, the 15th day of that month, they would dwell in booths. Now they had a custom. Now we know this custom is from Jewish sources, traditional sources, people like Josephus and others. The Jews had a custom that, on the, that, on the, that during the Feast of Tabernacles that they would go down, the high priest or the priest would carry a huge pitcher and he would go down to the pool of Siloam. You remember that last Wednesday night? He'd go down to the pool of Siloam. He'd fill that pitcher with water and he'd bring it back up to the altar outside, the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice. Not the altar of prayer, which is the golden altar. The brazen altar is the altar of sacrifice. And he would pour it out as a drink offering unto the Lord. It's the water to the Lord along with wine. 
And when he did this, the people had a lulav in one hand and they had fruit in the other hand and they would wave it and they would shout and glorify God. Jewish tradition tells us that you do not know what joy is like unless you are there on top of that mountain when they do this, when they're rejoicing in God their Savior. They quote Isaiah chapter number 55 and verse 1, if you'd like to turn there with me tonight. The 55th, 55th chapter of Isaiah and verse number 1. They quote this scripture because it's very appropriate. Isaiah 55 verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. So what a thing to rejoice over. You're thirsty. You thirst for that that sustains your life. You must have water. You can go longer without food than you can water. That water therefore becomes primary in sustaining your life. I'm going to say that again. Not the food, but the water is essential to sustain the life. Now, you have to have food, but you've got to have water before you have food or you'll dehydrate. And so Isaiah chapter number 55, they rejoice and they shout and they've drawn water out of the wells of salvation. Now, what well would that be? Or where, the, where would this water come from? What does, what does Siloam mean? From last week, I told you the meaning of it. You remember he put mud on the man, blind man's eyes. He said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And when he went to the pool of Siloam, he washed, came seeing his eyes, sight was given to him as a gift from God. The word Siloam means scent. It comes from the spring of Gihon that bubbles up and the waters flow down softly. It's called the waters of Shiloh in the Old Testament. The Lord rebuked the children of Israel because they had rejected the waters of Shiloh and they had turned to reason and reason, R-E-Z-I-N, not reason as you think, but reason as a king and as a people and as a place. In other words, they had looked somewhere else for their salvation. That's one of the greatest problems in the Old Testament is when Israel came under siege or their enemy approached their gates, then they would turn to make alliances with these local kings or with Egypt, which at one time was the most powerful army in the world. They would make alliances with these people and God would rebuke them for that and said, why is it that you've turned to them when you can turn to me and I can save you? So you can see how that the, uh, that the, that the waters that flow softly, gently, the waters of Shiloh are healing waters and saving waters. Now in the Bible, according to John chapter number 7, water is definitely a type of the Holy Ghost. It's a picture of the Spirit of God. And as you ch trace the references and do the comparisons in the Bible, you'll find that water originates in a number of places. You'll find that it comes forth from a rock when it's smitten. And then it's to be spoken to. And you know that Moses broke the typology. He should have, sp he should have uh, spoken the second time instead of smit smiting the rock. And But God in His graciousness sent forth water from the rock, but it cost him. Moses could not go into the promised land. He took him to Nebo, showed him Dan in the south, Be north and Beersheba in the south, and said, here Moses, you've told the people about the land, here's the land. But you cannot go in because you failed to sanctify me in the presence of the children of Israel. Watch how that word sanctify is used and you begin to understand what it means. You fail to set me apart as their Savior, their Lord, and their God. Do, do Learn this. This is one of the greatest truths you'll ever learn. Do not confuse that which is holy with that which is profane. And they've drunk the profane into the church today at the expense of the holy. What's the profane? Something that moves your flesh. The holy moves your spirit. God will move you from the inside. So the Bible says here in John chapter number 7 that on this great day, the Lord did something. Now in John chapter number 6, the context is manna. It's manna. It's, it's manna that comes down from heaven. And being manna, it sustains their life. John chapter number 6, and uh, I, won't pull, I won't take you to all the passages. We don't have uh, time to go through all that. But if you just look at the 6th chapter of the Gospel of John, you'll find out that it is manna 
That is the burden of that chapter. And of course, it's dealing with the manna that sustains their life. And, uh, and without that, they of course would have died. So you'll notice that the Lord has prepared them from John chapter number 6 for John chapter number 7. Because in John chapter number 7, he tells them plainly, he says, look at John 6 verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You see the believe and come, the coming and the believing? There's a difference there. The believing is a spiritual thing. You can only believe by faith and you receive by faith and you can drink fully and never thirst again. Do you remember what the Lord told the woman at the well in John 4? He said, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew what was available. Now she was religious and they worshiped in Mount Gerizim. She was a, what was she? She was Samaritan. She was a half-breed Jew. She even knew that Messiah was coming. They have their own Pentateuch. They have their own Pentateuch. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, and it's ancient. It's not identical to the Jewish Pentateuch, but it's very close. Which, of course, in itself is proof of the antiquity of the Word of God. When you think about the fact of how old this is, the Samaritan Pentateuch. But in any event, John chapter number four. He said, he said, give me to drink. And he, where was he when he said that? At whose well? Jacob's well. Jacob's well. And he said, give me to drink, to draw water from this well. In the Bible, wells, for the most part, are set in a good context. Water is set in a good context. You know, it's important to understand how these things in the Bible are presented to us. So the water that comes up out of that well would refresh and would, would, would sustain life. But he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that talks to you, you would ask of me and I'd give you what? Living water. Living water. That's what he's talking about in John 7. Living water. Water that is alive. Living water. And so in John chapter number 7, look what he says. It's quite a remarkable thing. John 7 and verse number 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. On the seventh day, they carried the water as they did all the six preceding days. They carried it to the top of the Temple Mount. They carried it to the altar, the brazen altar. And there it was to be poured out. The Lord Jesus is standing right there when all of the children of Israel have gathered around. And before that priest ever pours that water, he calls attention to himself. That water was created water. That water will come and go. And he says, look at me. He called attention to himself. And here's what he said. John chapter number 7. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me. You remember the context of John. Believeth, 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 believeth. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. <clears throat> There's a double application of this. One application is that what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing here is ministering something to them that comes from the Father. But the second application of this is that they are receiving something from God and what they are receiving from God will come into their innermost being and it won't come in there and stay there. It comes in there to move out from there. When God gave you the Holy Ghost, and let me tell you something tonight. If you are born of the Spirit of God, you've got the Holy Ghost. Don't ever let anybody try to flim flam you and go to the book of Acts, which is a transitional book, which is a book that has to do with certain people, certain places at certain times. 
Don't ever let anybody come up and tell you, oh, well, I know I'm saved, but I don't have the Holy Ghost yet. The Bible says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, in the book of, uh, the book of uh, Ephesians chapter number 4, the Bible says there is one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one what? All right. We'd better get that baptism right. Yeah. Better get it right. If there's just one baptism, it's either one, it's either water baptism or it is the baptism of the Holy Ghost that puts you into the Lord Jesus Christ. One or the other. Can't be both. Can't have two. Tell me something, dear friend. Do you think water has the same power that the Holy Ghost has to put you into the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I'm going to talk a little more about that in a moment. But I want you to think about it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, trying to lead you with your thinking in what I'm doing here. He said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. In other words, the apostle John, he's the one who put this in here in the next verse. John did. He said, how about he spake of the Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which has not yet been given. And here's the condition. Because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now he was in his passion, died on a cross. He was laid in a tomb. Three days later, he was raised from the dead. Then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And at the right hand of the Father, once he had ascended to the right hand of the Father, the Holy Spirit of God became his minister to minister the gifts and the power and the unction and the anointing that comes forth from the Father through the Son to you, but by the Holy Ghost of God. In plainer words, the Holy Spirit does not have His own separate, unique ministry. The Holy Spirit's ministry is by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. John 16, He said, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, hear who? Is he talking about hearing me? No. He's talking about hearing the Son as he intercedes to the Father on behalf of the church for the power of God to come down. Amen. What do you think happened in Burlington, North Carolina? Do you think that's of man? Or is that of God? Where did that spirit come from that came down upon those believers in North Carolina? Who sent that spirit? <laughs> The Spirit came from God the Father, sent by God the Son. This is why go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. He's the sent one. The Lord Jesus Christ is the apostle of our faith. The Greek word apostello, apostello means sent one. This is where we get the word apostle. Apostle John, Apostle Peter, Apostle Paul, these are sent ones which means much more than a disciple. A disciple is a follower, a learner that has been taught. We're all disciples. All of us near the house tonight are disciples, but we're not apostles. And there are those who have blown themselves up to the point where they think they are apostles. Have they ever blown themselves up? They blew themselves up. Or there's one around blowing them up. <laughs> He's called Satan. I've never met an apostle, but I've read what apostles said. But anyway, the apostle is one sent. The waters of Shiloh uh, or the waters of Siloam are sent waters. Now let that settle in for a moment. The Jordan River. Do you know what the word Jordan means? It means descender. It's a descender. Where does it start? Mount Hermon in the north. It bubbles. I've been there. I've been to Benias. There's a mountain here, a rock. And at Benias, the water literally comes bubbling up out of the ground. And that water that's bubbling up out of the ground comes from the top of Hermon. And Hermon is one of the highest spots in that whole area. And that water begins to descend. In other words, it's going down and it winds up in the Dead Sea. All right? And when the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized there, he went into the midst of death. He was baptized by John the Baptist and he came out of death. And the Holy Ghost came down as a dove and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. See what I mean? 
when they walked across on dry ground, and Joshua and the children of Israel, they walked across on dry ground, but the Bible, you know, the foot heel of the toe touched the water, and what happened? Now, it didn't split like the Red Sea. What happened to the water? Somebody remember? I haven't read it in a while. It's been some time. I'm just talking from memory. What happened to that water, the Jordan River? It stopped, and do you know where it stopped? It tells you in the Bible. What's that? It, yeah, but there's a name for the place. Adam. Boy, it stopped at a place called Adam. <laughs> well, that's a coincidence, preacher. You kidding? Where'd death start? It started with Adam. For as by one man's sin, death entered the world, death passed upon all men. So the water stops, and it, what's it do? Somebody said a moment ago. It just starts building up, doesn't it? It just builds up and 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 builds up. And the children of Israel walk across on dry ground. And that water up there is still building up. And they put their foot on the other side. They carry those stones out and put more in. And that water starts rushing down. They've crossed death. And they've walked freely through death. And so when the Lord Jesus was baptized, he was baptized in the Jordan River. Now, if baptism saves you, did the Lord Jesus need to be saved? Why was he baptized? That's just off my subject a little bit, but take that home with you and think about that for a minute. Why was he baptized? The Lord said to fulfill all righteousness. That's what he said. That's what he said. But that's the kind of thing that ought to make you go home and begin to think. Why was he baptized? But anyway, let's get back to our text here. And that is that when the waters... The water, the water that comes bubbling up is in him. And that water that is in him is the Holy Ghost. And he's giving the Holy Spirit. Notice, he gives. Look at John chapter number 20. John 19, John 20. Now, here we are. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she'd seen the Lord. John 20, verse 18. So what day is this? Pardon? Exactly, brother. This is Sunday. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, the disciples were shut. The doors were shut with the disciples assembled, fear of the Jews. Came Jesus, stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be to you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands, his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be to you as my Father hath, what now? Siloam. As he hath sent me, even so do I what to you? I anoint you as an apostle. I send you forth. Now watch carefully. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He's ministering now that living water. He's ministering it. He's ministering it. And they received it. They received it. Now, of course, there's one that wasn't there. He's something already happened before this, one of the 12. He wasn't there. You know who that was? Who? Well, I, yeah, him, but who was the other one? Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, the uh, ministry of the Spirit Verse 23, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted to them, and whosoever sins you retain, they're retained. Of course, it goes into Thomas. Now, Thomas was a good man. I've been with Thomas. I've walked with Thomas, talked with Thomas, sat with, ate with Thomas. Thomas and I have had a good time together. Amen. Amen. Both of us, big doubters. <laughs> no problem with Thomas. How many in here tonight understand what I'm talking about? Amen. We all know Thomas real good. And we name our children Thomas. We've got no problem with naming them Thomas. No problem. But I've never met a boy named Judas. <laughs> Amen. Or Jezebel. <laughs> Just don't meet them. No, but a lot of Bible names out there. People identify with Thomas. Thomas is a good name. Thomas is a good disciple. He's a good apostle. He was just a, had a little problem with belief. And the Lord, when he showed him, he said, Thomas, you believe now because you've seen. Well, we're the same way. Many, many times that I've had to see something before I believe. But anyway, he ministers the spirit of the living God to them. All right. Now, without getting all to the dispensational part of this, you remember what I told you about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. 
Remember I told you how the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force, right? And he said, unless you are born again, you can even see the kingdom of God. Now, ask you a simple question. Are the violent still taking the kingdom of heaven by violence? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But do they have a clue what the kingdom of God is? No. They don't have a clue. But if you're born again in here tonight, you do. You do. Because you have a spirit in you that witnesses with the spirit of those around you. So you've received something inside you. Now, I want to look at one aspect of this, and that's this. Do you know what a cistern is? When you go to, especially Masada, the most remarkable thing I've ever seen, folks, the guy that'll take you to Masada, you'll look inside, and I'm telling you, I am not exaggerating. Inside Masada, they will have a hewn out of solid rock, uh, a, 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 a container-like thing in there, where, and it's, it's as big or bigger than this whole inside of this building right here. Imagine doing that out of solid rock that gathers water. Water is so important to those people, gathers water. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with cisterns because we read about them in the Bible. But Jeremiah tells you something about a cistern. Chapter number 2 and verse number 13. Jeremiah 2, 13. Jeremiah says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. There's the fountain. And hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns. See here? Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now there's a vast difference between the two. Because that fountain will never run dry. And that fountain is pure and clean and holy. And if you want to be filled with a Holy Ghost of God, that's a promise. Be not drunk with wine where is an excess, but be what? Filled with a Holy Ghost. You can be filled. If you know the Lord, you can come to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I'm thirsty. And the waters will flow from Him like they did here on top of this mountain. And you can receive them into yourself. But it didn't fill you up for you to have a cistern to carry around and talk about how much water you got in you. That's a broken cistern. It's cracked. He'll fill you up as long as it's moving through you and ministering to somebody else. It's clean, isn't it, brother? It's, it stagnates. Yeah. In flowing water. Exactly. Now, is your water flowing or is it stagnating? That's what you have to choose tonight. God put you here to minister. He saved you to minister. He saved you to help somebody. He saved you to witness. He saved you to minister. He saved you to, to be in your life something that somebody would want to have, what you got. Something inside you that's better than what they've got. That's the power of the church. The power of the church is to manifest the Holy Spirit that Christ ministers to us and through Him to give to us. And He gave it. He, he ministered the Holy Spirit. And He ministered the Holy Spirit when He was glorified. So it was all the credentials that the Lord Jesus Christ had, all that He had accomplished, all that He is. The coming of the Holy Ghost is based on who the Lord Jesus Christ is. See? He's glorified. So what's that mean? That means that your life as a Christian is not about your accomplishments and it's not about your experience. It's not about the crowd you run with. It's about how much you know about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what your life as a Christian is about. There are people who desperately need what you have in your soul if you're born again. They desperately need it. So minister it to them. Minister it to them. And may God bless you. And when he got up and said that, no doubt many of them looked at him, and here's what they said. Go to John 7, verse 39. This spake he of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, 
because Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet, not a prophet, the prophet. Deuteronomy 32, Moses said, The Lord your God shall raise up unto thee a prophet like unto me. Did not Moses crack a rock and water came out? All right, now look what he said. Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. Yes, the Messiah. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? They didn't know where he came from. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? Very true. But you're basing your opinion, you're basing your conclusion on partial knowledge. That's what I'd say to these people. Sure, he's a Galilean. Sure, he walked up there in Galilee. That's where he came from. He came down from Galilee right before he stood on top of the Temple Mount. But that's not where he originated. Where was he born? He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Right? He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Was he the son of David? Yeah, absolutely. Read Matthew chapter number 1. He was the son of David. No question about it. You see, they were rejecting him on partial knowledge. Partial knowledge. And a lot of people are still doing that today. They're rejecting him on partial knowledge. Partial knowledge. That's no good. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? That's what he asked the disciples, didn't he? Who is he? Moses, Elias, one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And old Simon Bar-Jonah reared back and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord said, Simon Bar-Jonah, flesh and blood hath not revealed that to thee. You'll never know it from the flesh. If you walk out here on the street and ask people who the Lord Jesus is, you'll get a fleshly answer. Flesh and blood hath not revealed that to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The Bible says no man knows the Son but the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son. You'll only know the Son because the Father reveals him to you, and then the Son will reveal the Father to you. And by and through the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Are you thirsty? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you're blessed with the study of the Word of God tonight and the good folk that have come together. May I said something tonight, Lord, that will help them. That's why I'm here, Father. I'm here to help. May I, may I have said something tonight that will help them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, these young folks.